All right. Good morning, everybody. Hi. <laughs> um, so excited to talk about happiness today. Yeah. More and than happiness. To be more than happy. Because it's not enough to be a happy person. You have to be more than happy. So when people say, hey, how you doing? I'm like, I'm more than happy. Right? <laughs> and it's not just enough to make happiness your aim, but to make something more than happiness your Whoa, aim. Oh, yes. even more than happy? What could be better oh, than being happy? This about. is going to yes. get good. Oh, this is going to get so good. Uh, oh, okay. love my shirt. Thanks. Yeah. Hornet, I'm not, I'm not hornet kind, hair. hornet kind. I don't even know what hornet, hornet kind. wasp, wasp <laughs> kind, wasp kind. <laughs> I've never met a kind wasp. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, funny. Um, okay, so as we as we go through life, or even look back at life, or if you somehow measure life, and you know, we have tendencies, like that's a really good question. How do you measure your life, right? Well. That's, which is a really great book also. Yes. By oh, Clayton man. Christensen. Excellent You should book. read that book if you haven't read it. How Will You Measure Your Life by Clayton Christensen. So, but as you, as you start measuring your life, you start looking back at it. If you start looking at measuring even your kids or whatever, your own space, it very often comes back to how you happen to feel, doesn't it? You look back at a time period, you're like, oh man, that was dark. Or that was great. Or this, and and we we look at circumstances and things like that. But overall, it's how you feel. It's how you're feeling that is a major, major measurement for your life and how life seems to be going. It's like, okay, what am I feeling most of the time? You'll look back at time periods of your life. You'll just look at your situation and be like, well, what's you know? Because because things can be tough. Like like when you're first married, right? You first married, you're totally broke. You're just trying to figure out everything, but you're like, oh this man, it was amazing. Oh, it, was so it was the best time. And so it wasn't the circumstances, it was the feeling. Yeah. Right. Or even when you, you have a new baby. Oh my goodness. Those are the most exhausting months. One of my clients, um, two of my clients, they're married. <laughs> um, they just have a baby, right? And both of them are like only one of them had yeah, the baby. one of them had the baby, and both of them are sleep deprived. I'm <laughs> sure one more than the other. But I met with him recently, and he's like, Man, I definitely wouldn't say we're sleeping a lot or even enough, <laughs> but we're surviving, right? And but it's this like joy of new life and love. Exhausting and joy. It's this exhausting joy, but you look back and you're like, oh, that was amazing, even though it could be really hard. So ultimately, I want to invite you to consider that a major measurement of life is in your emotional state. It's now, how you happen to feel. I want to add something in here, kind of like a little bonus side tangent for a second. The reality is as well, not only when you look back on your life, is, is it determined, the, your feelings determine how you look at that period of time, mm -hmm. right? And how you, well... Your past feelings determine how you feel about it now, which that can get complicated. But if we want to think about how you actually create the life that you want, you have to look forward mentally, right? Because we can't physically look forward to our future. But by mentally looking forward to our future, if we generate feelings of happiness, now this is getting a little metaphysical here. But when, by generating feelings of happiness or joy or whatever it is you want in your future, that is actually how you create more of that, which is very fascinating. So, okay, now we're getting into, yeah, now we're getting into some good. So let me ask the question. What is it that makes you happy or, you know, it brings happiness? Is it your circumstances that bring happiness or can your happiness create your circumstances mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or even let's, let's go away from happiness. Do your feelings create your circumstances or do your circumstances create your feelings? Oh, 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 right. I would like to propose that the way we feel is a choice and what we choose has a major influence on how things go and particularly how we respond to how things go you guys with me on that oh yeah baby so let's um let's let's dive in here a little bit what do you 
and we, we've done this before, you guys. We've talked about this before, but I want you to, I want you to reevaluate again. Right now in your life, what what emotion would you say is your predominant emotion? What do you feel most of the time? So sorry, I wanted to oh. add something, but I got interrupted. Um, I wanted to say because you asked the question: Do our feelings create our circumstances, or do our circumstances create our feelings? And really, the answer is it's both. both. It's cyclical. And it's cyclical. So if we have an experience that generates certain emotions, if we're not proactive about what those emotions are, because yeah, it can come up, but we also have to be proactive about whether it stays that emotion or we alter it or we reframe it. If we're not proactive about it, then those emotions can then generate more of those circumstances. Exactly. And this is actually biologically, physiologically true, not just metaphysically or psychologically true. And, and in a major way, it's like a choose your own adventure book <laughs> right. because whatever the emotion is, you'll start leaning into creating more of that exactly. or creating frustration more of Frustration and irritation. More, 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 more frustration more. and irritation. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go, frustration and irritation or deep, deep gratitude and just joy of like, I love life. I just love life and more and more of loving life. Yeah. And, you, and it starts to rain. You're like, I love the I love rain. rain. And look at these flowers. We're over here like, oh, annoying. Gosh, it's raining again. Ba 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 ba. You see that? And, and you can start to create it. You start to notice it. You can literally activate your RAS, your reticular activating system, to look for annoying things or to look for beautiful things. To see the world as dangerous or to see the world as wonderful. And so you just start perpetuating more and more of the emotion and the circumstances, situations. Yes. Isn't this stuff amazing? Oh, I love it. Okay, let's see. A couple comments here. I'm actually drinking my matcha out of a mug I designed that says, today I choose to be happy. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. Um, that's actually one of the things I want to talk about a lot. Yes. Uh, I alternate between gratitude and overwhelm. Mm -hmm. interesting flip-flop yep that is really interesting and insightful right and i think i think many of us will have yeah um what do you call those i mean like, like sides of a spectrum you're yeah. just kind of maybe you swing back and forth. yeah on a pendulum you used to call it the pendulum because i yeah. would have that too it'd be like i'm over like, here what i'm over here what are you doing I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> right Which, every time we talk about that that scene from um tangled comes up Oh yeah. Where she's like, I'm a despicable human being. <laughs> this is the best day of my life. Yeah, exactly. And it's just pew, 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 right. Um, so I, I want to address this idea of choice. Um, today, well, then oh. then the today thing comes in too. But that our feelings, especially happiness, really are a choice. And I, I've told this story before, but I, I think it's a perfect illustration. John Maxwell is a is a phenomenal author and leader. And he and his wife were presenting at this large um, seminar and she was speaking. And somebody in the audience says, hey, I think she technically was on a panel. She was on some panel and talking. So they asked, they were asking, questions. they asked questions. And somebody said, it was like, how does John make you happy? Or does John make you happy? And she was like, no, he doesn't. And there was and like he this was, there was gas. Like an audible gas. Because he was one of the you know, leaders, like everybody came to hear him speak. And then there was this panel of wives and does John make you happy? Nope. No. And everyone like, was like, ah! what? Fraud! He's a fraud. He's a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> and, and her response was so profound. Her expounding, mm -hmm. articulating of what that meant. She really just said, look, no one can make you happy. Let that sink in. If you're well, taking said, notes, write that down. She said, I'm in charge of my own happiness. Mm -hmm. That was the emphasis. I am in charge of my own happiness. My husband can't make me happy. Now, can we do things for each other that generate love and positivity and all that? Yes, but ultimately we're responsible for our own happiness. We're in charge of that. So for some of us, that, no, for all of us, that is a very important concept that we need to re-examine often because it's easy to lean into, well, I just always thought my kids would bring me happiness. 
or if only my spouse would do this, then we would be happier. Yeah. Or if only. If he would stop doing that, or if she stops doing this, then, then I'll be happy. If only everything went perfectly smooth throughout the day, then I could be happy. And if I didn't have these constant interruptions to my work or to my reading or to whatever, then I could be happy. If things work out just like I expect them to, <laughs> then I'll be happy. That kind of rule, that specific one, is a recipe for being miserable <laughs> for a long, long time, right? Because like, how often are things going to work out like you expect? If only I didn't get interrupted anymore, then I would be happy. <laughs> what? And so I guess the, the this thing I want to emphasize here is happiness and, and whatever emotion you want to feel is your choice. And I want to invite you to choose it now. Choose to be happy now, today. How many of you have played the I'll be happy when game? Well, when the kids are out of diapers, when we have more money, when we're out of this house, when this clutter's gone, then I'll be happy. And the reality is those things can help. You're working with mm -hmm. a client right now who just moved out from living with her mother and having is a single mom living with her mother and it was chaos she moved into her own place and she's feeling better she is feeling happiness but the reality is that happiness is fleeting because the nature of reality in our existence is that there's always going to then be something else to come along and so we have to realize that that's the that's the truth there's going to be something else that comes along to irritate us or to cause chaos or to be annoying or to cause suffering or tragedy. So part of what I also want to emphasize and add today is that, yes, you can choose happiness and you can choose it regardless of your circumstances. But besides that, and maybe more important than that is choosing to find meaning. Whoa. And that's kind of why I wanted to talk about more than happy because I don't necessarily believe that happiness is the goal of life it's a great side benefit or it's a plus. great way to do life it's a great way to do life but more important than i think being happy is finding meaning and you can find meaning in life no matter what the circumstances you're not necessarily you can choose happiness but you may not want to choose happiness if someone dies or if right. you know something but tragic has happened but you can still choose to find meaning no matter what. And yes. And as we pursue meaning, it fills us mm -hmm. and fulfills us and it feels good. What's, what's interesting, two, two points, kind of one that Rachel was touching on, then, then another one, our lives can become so comfortable and so easy and sometimes so meaningless. It was interesting, Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, he, at the end of the book, you know, he's talking about his meaning therapy. He's like, I find so many people, therapy. he says, especially Americans, <laughs> whose, whose lives lack, just utter lack of meaning creates their like destitute feeling that they, they're suffering because they had so little meaning in their life. So I can Despite choose that, happiness. Comparatively Western society today has more comfort and luxury than any time. Anytime. That was, a, that's the one thing I was going to yeah. say is like, you know, we're like, just, just go back a hundred years. And you'd be like, oh, when I get to stop washing my laundry by hand, I will be happy for the rest <laughs> of my life. If I just had a machine that could wash my clothes. That, oh, I'd be, <laughs> if, if I had an oven, so I didn't have to make a fire. If I didn't go out and gather wood, come back, make a fire to cook my food. If I just had like, some machine that just i could just turn it on and cook There's food fire. oh then i, I would be happy. happy for the rest of my life if i didn't have to ride in a stupid wagon in the rain on this buckboard and bouncing along in rain and cold if i had like an enclosed wagon with temperature control temperature control i would never Shocks. complain again i would be the happiest person ever 
if I had comforts and conveniences. There's, a, there's like a psychological <laughs> term for this where you get used to the new, the new level, comfort and then you And complain. now there's yeah. something new <gasps> to complain about. Ah, right? I'm not happy anymore until I have this next thing, and right? It, and it happens to us all the time. We're like, oh my gosh, this internet is so slow. Like I swear it's 50 megs. Like what's wrong with this, <laughs> right? We just, we're constantly doing that. It's never fast enough. It's never good enough, right? Um, the the iconic one is they now this just blows my mind they literally have wi-fi on airplanes <laughs> I mean, it blows my mind um my son's friend was flying to peru several weeks ago and he was texting with her i was like i thought she was on the flight he's like she is she's somewhere over the ocean heading towards south america i'm like and you're texting yeah right back and forth like real-time texting and she's flying over the ocean towards it. Like, this is amazing, right? But um, one of the guys I was reading, he, he was like, he's like, how? He said, the guy I was sitting next to was complaining about the speeds. He's like, you're sitting on a comfortable chair, you know, temperature controlled on this huge chunk of metal flying across the world at fast speeds. And you're complaining about the Wi-Fi speed? Like, what? What is this? Right? So in, in that context, one, we have to stop. Oh, and I love Rachel says this all the time. Um, it's like we have to just be in awe and wonder at our lives. Every day when I just be like, are you kidding me? The neighbors aren't killing each other. <laughs> like I have electricity. I have internet. I got this is nice, comfortable clothes. We have computers. Like things work. Electricity's on. The, the heat's on when it's cold. The AC's on when it's hot. We have, a, we have a hot water heater that I don't use, but Rachel really <laughs> loves, right? Like you're still, you see what I'm saying? So we, every day we had to wake up just in awe and wonder and excitement being so grateful for all the little things, right? Um, and, and just look through those things. And then. This is your second point. Second point is every day do something that's meaningful, that really matters, that fills the soul. Because otherwise we live in this void. If, if all we're doing is pursuing comfort and ease and going through the motions of life, if we're just in some cases, in some cases, if we're just checking off the boxes, raising the kids, you know, keeping things from falling apart and dying at a bare minimum, ultimately it's not enough and you're going to feel pretty empty. Well, I think... I think it was just this morning I posted a reel on Instagram and it was um there's all these trending reels of like audios that you take and then you put it to your own videos and the, this audio that I grabbed it said some people are are I don't remember exactly but feeling overwhelmed with life because they think they have too much to do but the reality is that they do too little of the things that bring meaning to their life and so I think that's exactly what you're talking about here. Like if on a daily basis, you're not seeking meaning, that could be doing something that's meaningful or at least finding meaning in the things you're doing, then that's when we have these feelings of frustration, irritation, overwhelm, blah, 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 blah go on and on, fill in the blank with whatever your emotions are. It's because we're not seeking meaning. And so talking about being more than happy, like, yes, happiness is great. But ultimately, more important and more um, lasting than happiness even is meaning. And so see seeking meaning, and I, I would say that's definitely in two different ways. One, creating meaning and doing things that are meaningful to you. So if you like to paint, like spend more time painting because that fills you with meaning, which puts you in a state of flow, which actually lengthens your life. That's scientifically shown. People who spend more time in a state of flow, doing things that are meaningful to them, live longer. Um, and then the other thing is that if you're in the circumstances or situations that aren't meaningful to you, then you have to seek out the meaning in those circumstances. Like, why is my life a constant drudgery of washing dishes? Like, <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, even down to real tragedies. Where is the meaning to be found in that? Ooh. Okay. 
And I, I want to ask, actually, I'm going to ask, and then we'll touch on a point. I, we, I want, I think I, I want to address happiness and meaning mm -hmm. both. So what are ways that you would like to be more happy? And I want to hear like, you can throw in the chat, or if you can turn on your mic and let's share, what are some ways that you individually, personally would like to be more happy? And man, big one here. The first thing, I, okay, can I, can I say it like a cylinder? It's almost like we have this cylinder inside of us and it's, it's emotion. And if we fill it with a good emotion, there's no room for other stuff. But if we don't proactively and deliberately fill it with a good emotion, it creates this vacuum or void. And what jumps in there? Whoop. Irritation, resentment, frustration, jealousy, envy, annoyance, annoyance, gr like grudges, whatever, ah, bitterness. Like it just fills the void. And then you're like, oh, I feel terrible. Well, you push it back out, right? You just get that out. But as we're filling that, we have to look for leaks too. And I, I wholeheartedly believe there are like happiness drainers or leaks in our lives where we're going along and we really we're filling it up with happy we're like stuff, this is great and like, <laughs> just there's there's something <laughs> that is a happiness it's a happiness gone. vampire <laughs> in your life like there might be people or situations or circumstances that are just sucking you dry from your happiness and you're like i'm, I'm choosing happiness but i'm just I'm being doing great all the things there's and, a drink and so you're like I'm, I'm i'm doing all this and i still don't feel happy at least and not it, for longer than two minutes right and it might be there's something that's literally it's Dream. a it's a leech or a parasite it's a mm -hmm. happiness parasite it's just just sucking you dry well, and you got nothing what reminds me of this is um we were talking about this recently with our kids because we listened to a book called what was that book we all listened to and it talked about compound I, effect i think so it was called the compound effect but what he talked about is being and this is related specifically to people but i think you could apply this to everything in your life like the dishes or the laundry or whatever errands is that you i you have to be judgmental I'm going to use that word because usually it has a negative connotation, but it's not always negative. You have to be judgmental about what you allow in your life, including people. And so in this book, The Compound Effect, and we were talking about this with our youth, our teens, they brought it up because they remembered it. In the book, it says you literally need to go through all the people in your life and decide if they're a three-minute person, a three-hour person a three week person, a three month person. And what that means is how much time can you actually spend with them before they start to drain you? Some people you can literally spend three minutes with and they start to drain you. I know some three second people. <laughs> some people you could spend three hours and that's good. You could hang out, you could have a good time, but then you're like, after that, that's, that's not enough. as much. Some people, maybe it's three days. Some people, maybe it's three weeks. You have to learn to identify that and those people and that draining influence in your life in order to stop the drain of the happiness yeah. and other positive emotions. Because yeah. if you don't, you could be putting in all this happiness, but you're spending all your time with a three minute person and you're like, man, why do I just feel so drained? Well, that could be one of the reasons why. Now, of course, if some of those people are your family members, that makes it a little more challenging, right? You can't necessarily just like spend three minutes with the child <laughs> who's a three minute child. is my child and they're gonna live with me for a long time. So <laughs> that's when you when you, you that's when you have the opportunity to change things that's right? when, and change yourself. That's when home life literally becomes the laboratory of personal growth and development. That's what marriage is essentially. It's I'm not, a, I can't escape you. We're not right. getting away from our no way. You ain't getting away from me. <laughs> so we I'll have to learn. To the end of the earth. I'm teaching the principle. <laughs> we have to learn how to develop ourselves in order to make this situation better. Okay, ready? Ready for some re reflection here? And there's some comments. So let's, should we do the comments? Maybe. 
I want to ask though, maybe are you a happy person? Just sit with that for a second. You too, and me. Um, well, no, I a little immediately I have objections to your question. <laughs> Because I would say no. I don't, oh, I don't come know. on! Wait, wait, let me let me explain. I don't know that anyone, and I would say this is definitely true of you too. I'm a happy person. Right, but hold on. I don't know that anyone is necessarily born a happy person. Now, some people can have a tendency for more happiness than others, but I think happiness is a learned trait. Agreed. It's a, I would say it's, it might even be a skill. Yes, absolutely. So then I'm, I'm not asking you, are you born so this way? The default is because, yeah, the default is, I, I wouldn't even say unhappiness per se, but I would say the default is something like a sense of distraction. I'm, let's guess. Is I, I this know. charades? <laughs> yes, let's uh, do charades. <laughs> what are you? What's she doing? <laughs> we come into this world looking for danger and what's going to kill us, hurt us famous survival mode right? survival, it's a survival mode. brain yeah yeah so the default mode is like a survival brain type thing like you're trying to survive so you're not like sitting here like oh everything's happy and wonderful and peaceful and then you get attacked by a tiger and killed like <laughs> that's not default mode so what i'm saying is yeah we have to learn to be happy because we live in a different world than we evolved from which to your point, threats on our life aren't yeah, that right. common anymore. We're and, no longer and yet we're threatened, still and yet we're living in the survival mode. We're living brain. in survival mode as uh, though we're being threatened by something life threatening when really it's just our kids screaming or it's um, the news or whatever. Lovely. So she's saying, uh, Amy says, I understand Rachel's point. It doesn't have to be an identity, a person who chooses happiness versus I am a happy person. Ooh, good. Well, I like, yes, I like both of those. Mm -hmm. I know, I know on one side, the identity piece, when like somebody identifies as a runner, they say, no, I am a runner. What do, what do they do? Man, they run because they run. Right. Like, well, what if it rains and snows? They still run. And you're why? Like, well, because I'm a runner. I am a runner. I am a runner. It's like this identity piece, this I am, I am is one of the most powerful statements mm -hmm. in the world because you take on this identity. Right. So if you take on the identity of like, I am a happy person, who is it's liable to go. On the other side of what you're saying is I deliberately choose happiness in spite of circumstances or other things. It is a choice. It's a skill set I'm developing and working on it. Mm -hmm. I love both of those ideas. Yeah, I really do. So what would you like to do? And again, I want to, sh I want to share because I think we gained so many insights from each other. What would you like to do to be genuinely happier or joyful? I know, and I know this word joy kind of trumps happiness. Sometimes there's literal whole books written about how joy is the deep, real stuff and happiness is fleeting. So we're kind of using those interchangeably to be well, joyful and, and happy. And I think to possibly joy could be interchanged with meaning, meaning. Yep. but again and see I'm, I'm arguing this point because because of the reality that there is real challenge and struggle in the world like there's tragedy there's suffering there's hurricanes there's <laughs> pandemics there's you know all kinds of things there's living so, there's living in your trailer right we've done that <laughs> And, and even worse things, there's death, there's disease. And so sometimes you're not going to want to choose happiness right. or joy in those situations. And that's okay. Yep. We don't have to be like, oh, well, you should just choose to be happy anyways, even if your things are husband terrible. just died of cancer. No, that's not where there's both sides. Yep. I guess Absolutely. there's both sides. And Absolutely. so in those circumstances, when the happiness and joy can't be chosen or shouldn't be chosen right you can still choose the meaning yep choose to find meaning in the suffering in the tragedy in the annoyances in the irritations in the drudgeries 
right? You can choose to find meaning in those things, even if you can't choose to find happiness. Now I've gotten to the point where I'm, I enjoy and I find happiness in loading the dishwasher, right? But it wasn't always like that. There's been periods of my life where I hated loading the dishwasher. And every time I did it, I just created more negative emotions of like, why do I have to load the stupid dishes? And why is there so, you know, I, whatever you come up with. I'm still there. <laughs> Which is why I load the dishwasher and you don't. Dishes and vacuuming and sweeping. I love vacuuming. Oh. It's just so like, rewarding <laughs> so yeah that's a good point though like you're not required to find happiness in the dishes i guess if you don't want to what you've chosen is to not do <laughs> just totally that if does you, not bring me happiness i shall not to. do it right exactly <laughs> that's one strategy now i know you well enough that if you're doing the dishes and I'm this, choose, this, I'm is, not this be, is a metaphor yeah. now, but you're, you're, you find meaning in it. Right. Otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Right. I'm doing it for, to serve. I'm, I'm doing not going to sit there and be grumpy about it. Right. That's lame. Yeah. So that's kind of day. the metaphor there is there's different ways to approach it. You can find happiness and joy in doing it. You can eliminate it because it doesn't bring you happiness and joy, or you can find meaning because it has to be done anyways. And no one else can do it right now. Just get rid of the dishes. <laughs> There are no Not dishes. An option. <laughs> okay, so let's lean in. I want to hear from you. I want to hear your input. In what ways would you like to find or create? Create's probably the better word. Happiness and joy in your life. And you might look at it and be like, okay, which parts of my life am I not feeling very joyful or happy? And which parts of my life? And again, we're going to kind of do the meaning thing, and there's crossover, but just in and just feeling good most of the time on a general basis i, I, I want to invite you to do that because i to, think it's to possible make it to aim. feel good most of yeah. the time right okay so laura says yeah i would good. love to find you want to read it go for it sure i would love to find happiness in daily living we have a lot of happiness in our bus family adventures when we travel but at home in the daily grind we struggle yeah um i get that Ironically, <laughs> we find, at least I do, and I think my kids are finding some of that. I'm not going to speak for you yet. <laughs> we find some of this happiness and joy in the daily activities because it's been contrasted with, most recently, seven months on the road. Like we spent seven months driving through Mexico and Guatemala and we went to Ecuador and then we drove through the United States and like that was a long time and so for me I love coming back and getting into a routine and doing normal stuff and I think the kids like it too at least my teens are seeming to like it some of them <laughs> sometimes yeah but I think they are they're liking it more they, they look they're still looking forward to the next adventure but they're like, yeah, I like going to my lessons and I like decorating my room and I like, you know, doing that kind of stuff. And so and the same is true for me, in case you're wondering. I know. It makes I it sound like I'm Mr. Grumpy Pants around here. <laughs> Daily routines. I know. I guess I'm just saying, I know that Greg could take more of the adventure travel. You could probably maybe not though i think no, I after seven months we were both ready to come yeah. home we were like yeah we're ready to go back yeah. so yeah you're yeah. you're there with me on that but um so in some ways it's just a matter of well finding the meaning if there is a lot of the a lot of your daily living that you're not enjoying like start questioning it why aren't you enjoying it what is it about it that you don't like is it maybe that you're doing a lot of things you feel like you have to do and you're not doing things that you find meaningful because that's the reality that we've learned from experience of traveling because traveling does, it provides a lot of meaning because it helps you live in the moment. You're focused on what's happening right then and there. That's why you find the meaning, but you can produce that same feeling by looking for meaning and living in the moment when you're at home too. Now, maybe it's harder because, you know, when you're, in a novel situation, like in a foreign country, your brain is literally lit up because it's 
new stimuli, right? So you have to try and recreate that at home. But if, if you're doing things that just feel like a grind, it's time to reevaluate a lot of those things and how they're done. Because sometimes doing them in a different way can help make it more fun. Like yesterday, um, we did a morning devotional with our family, our teens. And then I had two of them were cleaning up the kitchen. Well, right away, what they do is they put on music because for them, that's how they make that fun and enjoyable and meaningful, right? So like, I'm doing chores, they put on music. And now it's not a grind to them. Yeah, maybe they'd rather do something else like go skydiving, right? But it's not a grind because they're listening to music that they enjoy and they're making it fun. Which we did that years ago. We started that by having cleaning parties, (laughs) right? We're like, okay, they like fun songs. Let's crank on a fun song. While the song is on, we're all going to clean up the house. Well, now they have this association of like, hey, will you guys help out with that? Sure. Music goes yeah, on. Exactly. And they could, and they make it fun. Right? Or they listen to an audiobook. Yep. If it's just them doing something, you know, then they listen to an audiobook. Yeah, which again, they're in this great book. They love, they're engaged. And so they're doing the dishes or doing the laundry or cleaning up the house, but they're somewhere else. So it's again, it's enjoyable. Mm-hmm. I just heard it, I read um, a story of a couple that they wanted to have their weekly finance meetings to go over their budget and just check their finances every week to make sure they're on target but they they hated it it was this grind of like uh, and sit down look at the numbers and so they didn't do it and so their their finances were kind of a mess right and they're like we have to do this they're like well why make it so hard why make it miserable let's make it fun what's our favorite snack together okay what's our favorite song list together playlist right and what's our favorite place and so they're like, ooh, let's go sit over here by the fireplace with these snacks and this song on, and then we'll have our meeting. And they started doing that, and they're like, oh, ooh, man, I love, gosh, I love our money meetings. Let's <laughs> go over the budget again just for fun, right? So you can switch things yeah. up and do things differently to generate mm-hmm. more good feelings. We don't have to be grinding through life. Well, and so Justine's comment here our daily routine is very meaningful when we're not in survival mode that's my big challenge finding happiness and meaning when things are so overwhelming that we're just trying to get through the day and survive yes so my first question is how many survival days are you having is this a regular because if this is a regular thing if you regularly feel like you're in survival mode that means there's something that's off systems usually systems maybe you just have too much you're trying to do maybe too many kids you gotta get rid of a few <laughs> just kidding Not never there's never too many kids like if you're feeling in survival mode regularly something's off yep. survival mode is meant to be temporary it's and and temporary could be months like if you had a baby or something okay yeah okay like i'm not saying that it like a new baby yeah you went through the end of the pregnancy and a new baby that's the only time i'd say months otherwise like we need to take drastic action all of us because i know we've all felt felt this and experienced it you need to take drastic action so that survival mode is really temporary and short-lived because okay, it changes so things up. She's expand, expanding here. Busy season for my hubby. He's working seven days a week for a few months and we're near the end, so it's temporary. Okay, so in a, this is perfect because <clears throat> one, if you're in chronic survival mode, something's off and you need to fix it, identify it and change it. Two, if you're in a survival mode, that's temporary and you know it's temporary like okay we're going into this period of time where he's going to be working more hours then what i do is i cut back on other stuff that's what i do i don't try to do as much i'm like we're in this temporary survival mode period where we're trying to accomplish this thing hubby working seven days a week so i'm not going to do as much i'm going to cut back and you get to decide what that is maybe i tell the kids no, we're not going to do all of these activities now because we're trying to focus on this and this is what needs to get done. And we have to do these things. So we're not doing that or switch it. Maybe, maybe we don't do 
clean up our dinner <laughs> as often because well, we're doing the activities or whatever. My first thought was start outsourcing. So all of a sudden too, you're, you're, you're calling like the, those driver delivery places yeah. and you're like, Uber Eats, bring us some food because I'm not cooking. Right. You just yeah. start outsourcing. You're like, okay, hire a cleaning company. Right. Um, you're like, man, you know what? While he's gone, I'm hiring a cleaning service. They're coming three days a week. Right? Or even once a week or once every other week would be helpful. Right. Just whatever to free up some of that space. So yeah. what would be fun is if we were doing a coaching session, I'd be like, okay, give me the list of things that's like feels overwhelming. And then let's identify the ones that can be eliminated temporarily or outsourced. Right. And so again, this applies to all of us, you guys, what's, what's preventing you from being happy or feeling better. What's, what's a drain. And you're like, it's this. Okay. What can you do about that? How can you be proactive about eliminating those things? Cause if, if, if Rachel's got this thorn here and she's just <laughs> trying so hard to be happy, Quit but it's just poking my thorns right there. I can't and concentrate. You, you guys ever had that? You had an injury, like you, you smash your thumb or you have a surgery. I, it happens for me with the hangnail. Like she's right got there, a little hangnail. Like, oh, hang some of us have hangnail. Some of us have like broken arms. Um, <laughs> but you, a toothache, okay, is a perfect example. Oh yeah. Your toothache is so... And you're sitting there, you're like, I'm trying to be happy. I'm trying to feel good. But this thing is just throbbing. And, and you're like, well, try to, or you're trying to pay attention. I'm like, hey, I really need you to pay attention to this really important equation I'm going to explain. And you're like, I can't even think straight. And some of those things are, some of the things in our lives are like a toothache. And, and they're so overwhelming is radiating throbs through our heads or our bodies or our spirits. Like it's really hard to even try to feel good because well, something right. you're, you're literally so in survival mode. Exactly. That's what that is. So that's what it's like. So um, just seeing added on here. I love that. I've been trying to keep up all the extras going on my own and I'm burnt out. Exactly. That is something yeah. that is a strategy I use all the time, giving myself grace. And when we're in, so like when we're traveling, okay. There's a big difference between how I run my family while we're traveling and how I run them while we're in our home. It's not the same. I don't have the same level of routines and to do's and, you know, chores and all that, because that's not going to be maintained when I add this level of chaos, if that makes sense. It's not sustainable. It would it's drive you crazy. It's not sustainable. Yeah. So when you're adding more chaos to your life, you have to. I guess you're reducing order in a way, but it's producing more order because you're not trying to maintain the same level of order that you had when you had like less chaos. I'm talking about like a yin and yang type thing. Because ultimately <clears throat> you find the most meaning in life when you can maintain the right amount of balance between order and chaos. So if there's an increased amount of chaos in your life, this isn't playing out exactly how I want it to, <laughs> but <laughs> the idea is you have to give yourself grace for everything else you were trying to maintain. And some of that, you just have to let go of for a while. And I do this all the time, all the time. I'm like, okay, we're doing this now. We're traveling for seven months. That means I'm not doing these things. And I don't hold myself to the same standards that I do when I'm at home, if that makes sense. Not that, not in a bad way of like, well, now I'm going to smoke and drink or like, you know, something silly like or that. Like, well, well, again, you, and you're not going to like, oh, I'm going to neglect my health now. Yeah. Uh, things are tough. So I'm not going to work out and I'm going to eat really unhealthy food. <laughs> like you don't do that because then that's self-sabotage. But you're just like, okay, I was spending an hour every day on this. I'm on my spend, morning routine. I'm going to spend 30 minutes. Now on. I'm not because there's more chaos going on. So I hope that makes sense. Um, Deb has a comment here. So as a parent of five grown kids, I've always chosen to be the outrageously optimistic woo-woo mom in person. I learned to overcome anxiety and depression, lots on inherited junk, no faith growing up, etc. Even so, most of my kids struggle with these things, some severely. I know they have their own journeys in life. I still interact with them in my it will all work out way. And some argue that it doesn't work out that way. Be quiet. Uh, <laughs> I'm walking. I'm walking that balance of parent and not trying to fix it. I choose happiness. So it's heartbreaking to see them struggle. Y'all just wait. I thought it would be easier when they grow up. Yeah. <laughs> it, I'm beginning to see, yes, 
your influence and role in your children's life for sure continues. And having younger children, I think is way easier than having older children and adults because if you think about yourself as a human being, I mean, you're a complex human being. You have lots of thoughts and feelings and emotions and experiences, and you're trying to synthesize all of that. As a parent, yeah, your responsibilities, duties, potentially influence expands as your children expand because you're now trying to help them with more complicated things. Now, what's interesting here too, because um, I think something that we need to emphasize is while choosing happiness is ideal, we are always respectful of our and our children's feelings. So if they're feeling sadness, if they're feeling overwhelm, if they're feeling whatever, all any of these negative feelings, all of these negative feelings, we don't try to discount them or to overcome them with positivity. Because we recognize that you have to allow yourself and you have to allow your children to feel their feelings. Because ultimately, that's the only way they're going to be able to process them is to be able to feel the sadness. And then when they're ready, learn how to overcome that on their own. Now, we're always there to be a counsel and support when they're like, man, I've just been feeling sad. You know, how can I feel better? How can I overcome this? How can I deal with this? We're there to provide tools and resources. And not that we've never done this, but we don't do this now, just saying, well, just be happy. Just, you know, choose to be happy isn't always the answer. No, there, there are rare occasions when it is. Yeah, when sometimes like, it's hey, like, hey, do, just- Do you have a legitimate reason to be yeah. grumpy and upset? And like, no, okay, let's, let's just switch. It's a choice, but that's rare. And it's, we will allow them to feel all of the emotions. That's yeah. good. It's very good to have this full range of emotions. We should all feel sad sometimes and angry sometimes mm -hmm. and, and melancholy other and times. Pessimistic like, and pessimistic. Just like, the whole range of emotions is a wonderful thing. I love what you brought up, Dev, here is like, and I want to emphasize this so much. We have the greatest opportunity and responsibility to mentor our children from when they're little until when they have their own children mm -hmm. and then our grandchildren. And we have to get dialed in ourselves about what I call emotional mastery. Um, not, not that you're mastering or controlling your emotions, but that you, you've obtained a level of mastery of in your skill. own emotional state. You have a skill level and you've learned how to work through this and learned what feelings are appropriate and how to choose how to appropriately and direct and express all that. The negative emotions, because yeah negative emotions can even have their place in your growth and development. Sometimes being angry or super upset about something is a good thing. There are things in the world that you should be upset about, like child trafficking or something like that. You know what I mean? Like you should be upset about that. And to just say, well, ah, just be happy. You know, that doesn't yeah. solve the problem. So there are real problems. There are real challenges. There are real things that depress us, right? Like weigh us down. And if we don't learn to address what it is that's weighing us down and to lift it naturally, then it's never, it, it becomes that thorn in the flesh where it's still there. And you're just like, Hey, no, I'm happy. Yeah. Everything's great. Yeah. Just don't touch right there, but I'm good. That's not the type of choosing happiness we're right. talking about. If there's a thorn, if there's a wound, if there's a problem, it's got to, it's be, got addressed. to be addressed. Oh, and that's addressed. not always a happy process. That's why the finding meaning comes in. Like, oh, I need to find meaning. I need to find healing. I need to find. Ooh, can I, can I get serious here from Momento with you? Um, I have the opportunity right now with a few of my amazing coaching clients we're dealing with some major, major things from the past. Um, in a couple instances, it was severe abuse 
that happened like two decades ago, but it was never fully processed. And so behind the scenes, it's still been causing problems all this time. It's like a wound that no matter how long you go or wherever you move or change or whatever, the wound is still there and it still bleeds. Well, and, and it still I, causes pain and distraction. I just want to add a comment that the way you can tell if you've actually processed something that's happened to you, traumatic or otherwise, is that when you think about that thing, if you still, if it still brings up a lot of intense emotion, then you haven't processed it. In other words, can you quote touch it without yeah, it the hurting? Thorn. If you can touch it where it used to hurt and you can touch it, it doesn't hurt anymore. It's been processed. Interestingly, through all of this, the way we heal a lot of those things is by learning to find the meaning in them, by finding value from what happened, even if it was a tragic and terrible thing. Is there value? Is there some kind of meaning? Is there some kind of benefit from the, the tragedy and trauma you went through? I know that was in my own journey and, and yours as well. Mm -hmm. We've been through hard things, right? Before we met each other, we went through stuff. But man, in our marriage, we've gone through tough stuff, right? Hard times. Um, 2008, 2007 and eight, when the economy, that was hard, hard, hard time for us, right? You can find value in that. And you can actually look back and be like, man, that was horrible. I'm actually grateful we went through that because of who we can become because of it mm -hmm. well even starting our marriage off my dad was diagnosed with cancer a week after we met and he died within two and a half years that brought a lot of meaning to our life and our marriage even though it was we kind of started event. in sadness and, yeah. and a tragedy um, right out the gates so man I, I, so I wanted to touch on that. There, there's things I, I'm guessing many of us, if not all of us, have some painful things. They all need to be processed. And if you haven't processed them yet, behind the scenes, so to speak, kind of in your subconscious operating system, they can be preventing you from having this full range of emotions, especially good emotions. You might be hanging on to something that feels like this, this limiter. And, and you're, you're just about to lean into goodness. And I, I can't quite because of that thing. Well, or the other side is you're, you're portraying all these motions of happiness. You're choosing happiness, but it, the depth of it isn't there because it's more of a front to cover up and protect the wounds and the, the thorns. Right. So that relates to what I want to talk about with kids and ourselves is we have to develop the skill set to be able to do these things. So sometimes we, we ourselves haven't learned how to do that. And it's a skill. It's something we learn. And maybe our kids haven't learned how to do that. So our adult children might be out just struggling and going through grind saying nothing's going to work out. Life sucks. And then you die and it's horrible. <laughs> maybe they haven't learned to develop the skill to handle those things as adults, right? It's one thing to handle them as kids. It's another thing to handle them as adults. And that's where we can lean in as mentors and really give them the skills and the tools and the training and the example modeling how to develop that. The researchers found there's four specific brain circuits for happiness. And, and this one's critical and it's, it's all learnable. It's, it's a skill set. Well, is this in part answering Laura's question? Here? Yes. So yes, how do it we is. develop the skill set? Yep. And we'll come back to Justine's question too. Okay. So this is important. He's going to explain, this is literally scientifically backed up plus religiously, philosophically, psychologically backed right, up. It's just across the board. And if you want to dive into it more, He's getting this specific part from the Book of Joy by the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. Which so is can... really awesome. Really, really awesome. That's a great book. That's, in fact, I highly recommend that book. Read <laughs> the Book of Joy. Especially since we're talking about yeah, this topic. Right? Like, Just yeah. read the Book of Joy. It's amazing. You'll well, love and I'm going to add this one second because okay. we're talking about recommendations. Another great one, which I would recommend, is this one called More Than Happy, The Wisdom of Amish Parenting, which talks about, just slight tangent here for a second, then we'll go back to your brain thing. Um, that the Amish people don't teach their kids to be happy. They teach them to have respect and to work hard and to, you know, all these other traits, which ends up making the Amish people in general more Happier happy. 
but it's because oh it says it's like that is that c.s lewis quote that if you yes. go looking for happiness or comfort and comfort says. you actually find depression anxiety like you find the things you don't want when you go seeking for comfort and happiness but if you go seeking for meaning I'm really paraphrasing this quote here, but this is the gist of it. <laughs> when you go seeking for meaning, you find comfort and happiness as a result. Right. Anyways, okay, back to your yeah. brain. Thing. Sometimes we go looking for the side effects instead of looking for the cause and then enjoying the side effects. If you go looking for the side effects without the cause, you'll miss it. Okay. So yeah. the, the four brain circuits are number one, you have to be able to get into a positive state. Again, that is I, a skill set. I just want set. to emphasize one second. Can I finish a sentence here? I'm emphasizing. I'm just kidding. This is literally the things you work on to develop the skill set of having more positive emotion in your life. And you have to practice it. Yes. You've got to practice. work on it. So wherever you're at in your emotional spectrum, it's almost always because of training and conditioning. So if you're, if you feel frustrated most of the time, irritated most of the time, blah most of the time, bothered, whatever it is, wherever you're at, if it's if it's happening perpetually, it's mostly just from conditioning and training. And obviously, it's affected by your physiological state, whether you're getting enough sleep or good food, and and all these other elements. If your brain's not getting enough healthy fats, that leads to or you're depression. not getting enough sleep. And it's connected to what we talked to more with what Justine was saying, that sometimes maybe you're just trying to do too much and you need to cut back, scale back, because the goal isn't to just constantly be doing as much right. as we can. The, the goal is to balance that out so that you have a feeling of meaning and enjoyment in life. Yeah. If you're not feeling meaning and enjoyment on a regular basis, something's wrong. <laughs> you need to be like, wow, something's off here because I'm irritated every single day. Yeah. Like change something. Don't just keep living in that state because it's not good for you yeah. and it's actually killing you yeah. slowly. Yeah. Okay. Back to the brain I, thing. I wholeheartedly believe that we should be joyful and happy most of the time. But it takes years of practice yes. to get to that. Okay. Point. So developing the skill set. Number one, get into a positive state. That's the, that's the first circuit. And if you don't know how to get into a positive state, you need to learn how yeah. to get into a positive Practice. state. For it you, can, is that listening to music, dancing? It could, it could be a flower or a puppy. Going in nature. Or a walk. Or it could be meditating or My relaxing. uncle looks in his dog's eyes. Okay. Remember? Uncle Ross talks about how he oh, looks yeah. in his dog's eyes and, and it, it reduces just, his blood yeah, pressure like, levels. Oh, <laughs> cute little dog, right? Like whatever it is for you, get into a positive state. And do it every day. Some of you are so wonderful at self-sacrifice that you're putting, you're sacrificing yourself on the altar. Like it's okay. And not only okay, it's wonderful it's for you to do some things every day that just put you in a positive state. Do that and tell the kids, wait a moment. I'm getting in a positive state going into right my now. Positive so state. Leave. <laughs> Don't talk to me. I'm going into a positive state. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Now, and with Do practice, things. like you especially, you can get into a positive state like that. Yep. Now, initially, that it takes practice. You might have to go away for an hour. Who knows what it is? A week. Yeah. I, yeah, I can get into a positive but state But with practice, instantly. you can get it. It can be very quick, and you can switch your state almost immediately. And what you do is you practice with more and more things. If you're like right now, you're like, there's only one thing that makes me happy. And it's eating at uh Leatherby's ice cream. That's horrible. I know. I'm just what you come up with that for? Don't out do that. If, if your happiness is like from unhealthy stuff, like yeah, drop that and find something else to be happy. I was thinking more of that restaurant in Paris. Oh, What's Arpege. Arpege. <laughs> only at Arpege. Three <laughs> then I can be stars. Happy. Like, okay. You're not going to be happy very often. So find more things, get into positive yes. states. That's number one. Number two. Number two is the ability to recover from a negative state. Now, this is a critically important skill set that most people do not have. And I doubt most of our children have. 
We have to teach them, even our adult children, we have to teach them and train them, give them tools and training and modeling how to recover from a negative state. Because if we don't recover, what happens? You stay in it for hours or days or weeks or well, months or years or decades. And the reality is that, yeah, the longer you stay in a negative state, then it becomes a mood which then becomes over time a personality, a personality or character trait, or character trait. Yeah. So if you don't get out of negative states, it becomes your state. It becomes your personality. Now this is related to, but slightly different from what we were talking about before about allowing ourselves and our children to feel negative emotions. That still is a part of life, but not to the point where it becomes a mood and then a personality trait. Yes. We want our kids to feel negative emotions, but we want to teach them how to recover from a negative state so that it doesn't maintain itself over a long period of yep. time. So, so there's different things going on there. Love it. And now and some, there's a book sorry. recommend. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> some Man, you kids, are on it today. I'm going to sit down over no, here. Don't, no, don't, don't sit down. Some kids <sighs> develop a mood. Some kids get in a negative state. I, I've seen this with my own kids. They get in a negative state that then becomes a mood, that then becomes a personality trait. I don't know. Anyways, I don't know that we've seen that long-term, but point being, because I did this as a kid too, they're rebelling against you trying to get them into a positive state, right? So we have to be careful here because if done in the wrong way, our children will, and I, I did this, I was this rebellious teenager, our children will do something that's not good for them just because they're trying to go against what the parent is doing. And so, especially early on, we saw, oh, this isn't working when we're trying to use our positivity to say, just be happy, you know? We're like, that doesn't work. Cause then they stay in the mood longer because we're trying to get them out of the negative mood. But when we allow them, and that's why this is what we do now, when we allow them to feel that feeling and feel that, sadness or whatever it is then on their own they're like well I don't want to stay here this is kind of boring and or, or depressing now like what do I do to get out of it and that's when we're like okay here's the tools here's how you recover from a negative state so it's a delicate balance too yeah so it has to be done with tact and art and diplomacy there's an art and science to it of introducing it and teaching it but again do you know how to do it do you know how to effectively recover from a negative state? Mm -hmm. And if you do, do you articulate it? Do you show the process to your kids and the people around you so they go, so at least they have the model and go, oh, it can be done and here's the steps to do it. Yeah. So I want. So if you I, don't know, man, you gotta figure then that the out. invitation is figure, figure that out. Figure out. out how to get in a positive state and what puts you in a positive state and then figure out how to recover from a negative state and what, it could be the same thing. Yep. Recovery sometimes just goes back to getting in a positive state yeah. or processing it. If, if Rachel says or does something that puts me into a negative state, I've got to process it. Like what, what, why was does that? that? Bother why does that so bother much? me? I got to work through why, it. See what if it's did it me. Make me feel and why? See if it's her, talk to her about it and be like, Hey, this, this man, is how I felt when you said off. this. And I'm wondering why. And then you talk through it. You work through it. I don't identify. shove it down. Like, recovering from a negative state is not burying it that is such an unhealthy practice we just bury all those emotions and then they explode and they stay in there and they get toxic so i'm processing i'm getting out and then i choose to get back into a positive state the third thing was really awesome is focus that was the third channel focus brings happiness it's learning how to focus and in our day and age man we have created a societal problem of an inability to really focus in so well, practice this, it's a skill set. I want to touch on this. I think partly that's because we've been conditioned or taught to focus on things that maybe we don't personally care about. Yep. So part of this idea of focus, I think ties into flow, Agreed. which is look for more of the things that you want to focus on. Um, Jordan Peterson says something that's so fascinating to me. He's like, he's a clinical psychologist and he says, you can't force yourself to be interested in something interest just happens. So nobody really knows like why I would be interested in this straw when Greg's not like it's my interests are unique to me. And so when we learn to pay attention to our interests, 
those are clues to things that we find meaningful. So if you can look for what you're genuinely interested in, instead of forcing yourself, trying to force yourself to be interested in things you're not interested in, because you can't do that, interests can't be forced. You pay attention to those interests, and that is usually where you will find meaning. So focus on meaningful things. Yeah. Meaningful, meaningful to you. Interest. Yeah. yeah. Love that. The fourth thing that uh, won't surprise anyone is generosity. Just being generous, generous with your love, generous with your time, generous with your attention, generous with your resources. It just makes you feel so happy. So you can practice happiness by just being generous, right? And there's lots of ways to do that. So all those are awesome and they can be practiced. Let's, let's answer this question here about uh, what's happening in the world right now. Yeah, that's good. And then, I'm just going to Oh yeah, read that one book. real quick. Yep. If you haven't read this book yet, I think you'd like it. Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess by Carolyn Leaf. Yeah, I haven't read that. Lots Sounds of great. brain info plus skills for dealing with toxic thoughts. Fantastic. Cool. And it's such an important thing. That's that's a lot of processing and recovering from negative states. It's really, mm -hmm. really good. Okay, here's this great question. It says, how do you guys deal with the emotions from things we can't really change? Uh, for example, the political things going on in the world right mm -hmm. now, right? <laughs> and situations that are outside of our control individually or as a family. And it, it like creates, it creates a lot of that stuff, right? Um, I was going to give another book recommendation. Did I... So it was, um, well, the book of joy was one. Um, I don't remember. Do you remember? Wait. Was I going to say another recommendation? I don't know. Um, I can't think of it right now. Okay, but let's answer that question. Clues last time. Okay, so I was literally listening to something this morning that deals with this, the emotions of things we can't really change because he was talking about I was list, I was finishing Becoming Supernatural by Dr. Joe Dispenza, which we've told you before about breaking the habit of being yourself by him. But That's at the very end, excellent one for this. At the very end, he was talking about when you allow your energy, your emotions to be directed. Say it directed towards, he was specifically talking about like political leaders or things going on in the world. Like when you allow your energy to go out into the world in a way, you're essentially giving up like your power, you're giving up your life force. And yes. so he was talking about yes. that we have the only way to create change is to focus on controlling our own energy. We are an energetic being like you are made of energy that's essentially what you are atoms are energy learning to control your energy like which is exactly what we've been talking about this whole time like processing you know generating positive energy processing negative energy that is how you stay in control of your own power so whenever we allow ourselves to get bothered now again we did mention that sometimes there's things you should get upset about but there are a lot fewer things we should get upset about than we probably get upset about on a regular basis. There's not a lot we can do about a lot of things. We but, should get upset about the things we can do. And I, and I think it's, it's valuable to order those things because if you allow yourself to be bothered by small things, you're going to be bothered all the time, Yeah, all the time. So you have to look at the small things like it's a small thing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to give away my power, my energy, me, to that thing it's not worth it but if there's something big like major violations of freedom and like you know huge injustices whoo man you can get fired up about that but with this with this warning if there genuinely is nothing that you can do about it being fired up about it all the time isn't serving you. It doesn't serve you. It just it's ruining your day and not doing anything to make it better. And so essentially what I'm saying and what I took him to be saying is that you have to learn to control and direct your energy to focus it in the right place. And so essentially that means directing it in the areas where you can have some sort of impact and influence. Now that for, for all people starts out with you. Jordan Peterson talks about this all the time. And the more he says it, the more I realize it's true. If you can't direct and control your own environment, well, even let's start inside yes. your own thoughts, your own feelings, and then your environment. How can you 
change the world. And this is a principle that's taught again and again and again. Like you can't think that you're gonna go change the world politically or whatever other level that's out there you could influence the world. Well, even on a community level, right? Yeah. School board, city council. You can't do that until you get your own house in order, until you get your own mind and thoughts in order. Now, it doesn't well, mean you can't start moving forward. It, man, and it has to start in your own head. If, if you still cannot control and direct your own thoughts, which, of course, you guys know this already, is the driving force for all your emotions and feelings. Like if you have an emotion, it's caused by a thought. And the thought is usually giving meaning to something. So something happens politically or whatever, or economically, boom, your thought about that is creating the emotion yeah. or feeling. It's right? not the event itself that's creating the emotion. It's your thought and interpretation of what that about event means that thing. that's giving you the emotion. So you've got to be like, what thought is creating this feeling? So go back upstream and be like, yeah, that's that's wrong. It's, it's bothering me. And this thought, what does that mean? So we have to control and direct this which controls and directs this and then controls and directs our home and our own environment, then we can start leaning out outwardly to get involved Spanning with more out, things. Exactly. Because in going back to becoming supernatural, that's essentially what he's talking about. The only way that we're going to see real change in the world is when each individual person focuses on using their energy to make the most of themselves thoughts feelings and emotions and then outward actions into starting with your marriage your long-term relationship into your family and then into the world people want to jump ahead the, and this drives greg and i crazy like we talk about this all the time we're like why are they their their family life is a mess like what are they doing they're out there trying to like whatever in their church or their community. And we're like, dude, get home and fix your family. Like what's the problem here? That's where it starts. You have to start in your own heart and mind, in your relationship, and then your family. And once you feel like you've got that down, then, you know, start looking beyond that. So that's my take all day long i love it and one thing we do when and that's what will change the world something outside that's like stirring up and we look at it and go oh boy we take all that <laughs> and, we and we double down at home, like, down okay, at home. <laughs> hey like this is what we're gonna do what this is what this is what prevents those problems this is what we can do to impress yeah. this is how we understand it let's read more books so we all read animal farm as a family i recommend all of you reading animal farm with your family and discussing it and and see if there's current yeah. day applications and um, well, and, and that's a perfect example. We take what we're seeing in the world that can be disturbed. We're not going to lie. We get upset about stuff too. We're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. But we take that energy and we don't just get mad about it and post on Facebook or something because that's. And useless. then get mad about all the comments on Facebook. <laughs> we take that energy and we direct it where we have influence. And that's in our family, with our discussions, with our children. And we do something like read Animal, animal Farm and talk about it. So here, here's a here's a quote. People might be getting paralyzed by what national news, um, which is highly uncontrollable, but sending emails to school boards, speaking at meetings is closer to being within influence, right? And it what's interesting, be. the way you think and feel about it will be a difference. You guys remember that amazing um, Aesop's fable about the north wind and the sun? There was a guy walking along with a jacket and the north wind went to the sun and said, hey, let's have a competition, see who can get this coat off this guy. So the north wind came in and blew and blew and blew with all its strength and blew and blew and blew. And the more the wind blew, the more that guy held on to it, just fighting and resisting and blew and blew and blew until it just was exhausted. And he just held on and fought it. And then the sun said, okay, let me try. And he just put out a few gentle rays and man whew, pulled off his coat, right? So the way you think about it, feel about it, and process it will determine how you influence. And again, who, who's more likely to influence us? Someone who's happy and joyful well, and looking for meaning and and in in that way and again we can be strong we can be firm but the way we approach it you can tell where we're at and again bitterness is a poison and, we swallow hoping our enemies will die and i want to add this too is that we have to be really sure and committed to doing something like that like even getting involved with a school school board or whatever because if you're 
actually going to make some sort of change, it usually statistically is a very long involved process. Like you're gonna be devoting a lot of time, energy and attention to doing that thing. So that's why for me, yeah, you could get involved on a city council or a school board, but, but you gotta know like that's your thing. Like that's a part of your mission. Cause just being like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get involved because it will make a difference. That usually doesn't work. It's gotta be like, this is my mission. I'm going to get involved. I'm gonna have a voice. I'm gonna be a leader. That's when you actually make a difference. Otherwise it's a waste of your time, energy and effort that could be put into your family or something else where you're actually gonna have a yes. long-term impact down the road. Like yes. we feel like that doesn't have us have a significant impact because you know our children are small or they're growing, they're still developing. But that has a ripple effect across the ages. That's ultimately what's going to change the world in my mind. Yes. Stick to your mission. Okay. Uh, let's wrap up with Emily's comment here. Mother Teresa is credited as saying, if you want to bring happiness to the whole world, go home and love your family. Oh, love that. So let's start with ourselves and be, be genuinely happy and joyful. And, and find meaning. Find meaning and create meaning. Do meaningful things. Share that with your spouse, then with your children. And then when, once that's solid and is beautiful, or as it's, radiate, as it's becoming that way, radiate and share it. But let's, most of the time, let's feel good and practice choosing to be in a positive state and choosing the emotions we want to feel throughout our lives. Because that's circling back now. That's going to be in a major way how we how we measure how our life went was how we feel about it. Okay. Love you guys. Have an absolutely fantastic day and week and enjoy the fall. Get out and do awesome things. Reach upward.